So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Saab Mirza, PC candidate for BME department here at FIU. And on behalf of EMBS, I'm going to be doing the third part of a workshop for um, our MATLAB series. And this one's going to cover PCA, computer vision, and machine learning. Now, just like with all the previous events, I'm going to be giving this PowerPoint and scripts to Alejandro, and he's going to upload it to the description of the YouTube videos. So you don't need to actually actively follow me as I'm coding. You can just sort of absorb as I explain everything and then actually do work on the code afterwards when you get done. First, PCA. What is PCA? PCA stands for them in terms of importance on your output variables. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can explain this. Um, you can explain this using eigenvalues, vectors, covariance, and such. And the most important thing about PCA is that it allows you to start separating your data based on what is most important in terms of the variables. So here's an example of a PC1 and PC2 plot. And these are generally called screen plots. And it's splitting the population of Finland, it, uh, Italy, Netherlands, and UK based on some variables. And it looks like the population of Finland can be separated from the population of Netherlands, from the population of, of Italy, based off these PC1 and PC2 components. Now, what these PC1 and PC2 represent, they're linear combinations of other variables. So here's an example of one way that you might have be able to use PCA. Let's say you had a combination of 100 wine bottles and you had them categorized by 20 different parameters, age, location, percent alcohol, color, acidity, price, so on and so forth. You wanna know, is there a smaller set of these parameters, these 20 parameters that lets you delineate um, these bottles into specific groups so that you don't need to know, oh, what are the 20 different parameters for this bottle to know that it goes into this category. Maybe you only need five or six parameters or maybe even less to categorize each of these bottles uniquely. So to do that, you can do a PC analysis to figure out which one of these parameters contribute the most to describing what is or isn't a specific wine bottle. For example, you could find that the bottles that can be separated the most by age, percent alcohol, and acidity are, are what actually determines how you can separate the bottles. But all other parameters don't really matter as much. So the location, the color, the price, those don't matter too much. And this way you can now reduce your 20 parameters set to three, and you've essentially done a dimensional reduction in your parameter space. And that's the purpose of PCA. So if you have low dimensional data, like one or two measurements per subject, it's fairly easy to delineate and graph them. So for example, let's say you had four different mice and you're recording the expression of a, of a certain gene in the mice. If you just have one gene, you can plot the result on number line. And if you plot it on number line, then you can easily see, oh, uh, mouse one and two generally fall on the low end, mouse three and four generally fall on the high end. Not too difficult at all. Go to two dimensions, two different genes. One gene on the x-axis, one gene on the y-axis. And now if you plot the results for mouse one, two, three, and four, you can see, you can still sort of see, oh, mouse one and two clump up here, three and four clump up here, easy enough. So now, what if you had high dimensional data where you wanted to have 20,000 different measurements across 1,000 different subjects? You can't have a graph with 20,000 axes. You can, I guess, but you're not gonna be able to make much sense out of it. So if you can do PC analysis and reduce these 20,000 different parameters down to four to five, six, just a handful of them that make the most difference in terms of describing your data, then you can better delineate your data sets and delineate your mice into different groups. I'm, and for these for this slide and the subsequent slides on PC, I'm taking a lot from a uh, YouTuber by name of StatQuest. So if you want a more in-depth video, you can follow this YouTube link right here. So how do you actually do a PCA analysis? So let's say you had two-dimensional data. So you have four different mice, two different genes, and you plot them on a graph, gene one versus gene two, and that's how you plot them. Now, what you wanna do is you wanna subtract gene one, gene one's mean from each value of gene one, and then subtract gene two means from each value of gene two. So you take the mean value of gene one, so it's some value here, let's say, and subtract it off, from gene one, so now everything moves to the left slightly. 
and you want to do the same, you take the average of gene two, so that would be the Y component, subtract that from the gene two for each one of them, and now you can see everything sort of centered around zero. Now that you have your data centered, you can do what's called fitting a line. And this line of best fit, that is gonna cut through your data and, um, with the minimum perpendicular distance to the data. This is called PC1. Now this line, it has a rise and a slope to it. The rise is how much it going, it's going up on gene two, and the run is how much it's going on gene one. And if you, do, if you calculate how much it rises and runs, that's the, um, these are called the unit vector or the singular vector or the eigenvector of this component. And you can, so in this example case, gene one is 0.8 and gene two is six. So you have to go 0.8 to the right and 0.6 up to run across this line. Now, if you sum the distances along this PC line that you just made with each of these data points, how, however high this value is, is what's called the eigenvalue. And this will tell you the relative amount of variance that can be explained along this PC. And there's only exist a single line that best fits the data um, for each individual PC. So you can see here, you have your data here and you wanna find the line that cuts through them and minimizes the perpendicular distance. You wouldn't want it to be this way. You wouldn't want it to be this way. There's a single line that cuts through it the best. And this first line is always called PC1. Now, if you draw a line that's perpendicular to this PC1, that line is called PC2. And you can imagine, okay, if that's, if the first PC1 is the line that best represents the data um, by minimizing it in this dimension, the second one is gonna be perpendicular to it and it's the second best at uh, delineating the, the shape of the graph. And you can do PC3, which in our case would be a line that's perpendicular to both PC1 and PC2. So that'd be a line that goes not this way or that way, but into and out of your screen essentially. And just like PC1, PC2 has its eigenvector associated value and its own eigenvalue. And now that you have all of this, you can think of this PC1 and PC2 as their own X and Y axis, rotate your graph. And now you have a new X, Y axis that takes PC1 and PC2 as its components. And your X and Y axis are now your original x and y axis, which for us was gene one and g two, are no longer considered. And so now you can see that you're in your data set, PC one really separates your data, and PC two somewhat separates your data, but not as much as PC one does. So, um, yeah. So you can see here on the data data spread along PC one, uh, mice one and two are more similar because they're closer together on the PC graph than three and four. Now, here are some misconceptions and best practices. The principal components that you made are not the variables. So PC1 is not the same as gene one. Remember, when you did this fitting here, PC2 is made up of a linear combination of gene one and gene two. So the PC components are linear combinations of all of your variables. They're not the actual variables. So they're linear combinations and their value corresponds to which variable has the most impact on your variance. So now comes the question of, okay, if you had 20,000 different variables, so you had 20,000 different PC components, our principal components, how do you know which ones to keep, which ones to remove? You have to look at their eigenvalues or how much they, they explain um, the variance in your data. And one way you can do that is a screen plot. And a screen plot basically just plots out how much each principal component explains the variance from highest to lowest. And in this example case here, PC1 explains the largest majority. PC2, pretty much half, but PC3 and not so much, maybe like five or so percent of the entire variance. So in this particular case, PC3, not that important to explain the variation. You can remove it while still keeping the majority of your data intact. Now here's a case where you might not want to do that. PC1 accounts for the most. PC2 counts for a decent amount as well, but PC3 is almost comparable to PC2. So in this case, I would hesitate about excluding PC3. So you always have to take a look at your screen plots to figure out which PC components you can keep and which ones you should remove. So now we can get around to doing an actual example, but before I do this, are there any questions? 
So it only works with linear combinations, if I understand correctly. So yeah, PC, uh, the PC components inherently try to do linear combinations of all your data sets, but it works surprisingly well for pretty much any data set, even if it just does linear combinations of every uh, variable you have. Any other questions? All right, so here is the Iris data set. And this is a very popular data set that's used in statistical analysis, machine learning. And it consists of 150 samples. You can consider them instances, observations, and they have four features with each sample. So you can consider this to be 150 mice and four different genes, let's say. Um, and these features or attributes, measurements, dimensions, whatever you want to call them, are the sample length, width, the pedal length and the pedal width, and they're given here on this image right here. And the result is you have a label associated with each. And this is the um, actual species that's associated with. And in this case, we have three labels. So depending on what the sepal length width and pedal length width are, the uh, particular plant can either be labeled as a stentosa, a versicolor, or a virginica. And these are three different classes. And our job is to see, okay, can we do PCA analysis to reduce the dimensions of, of this from four to something smaller and see if we can use that to delineate class more easily. Because right now we have four dimensions. Can we reduce that down to maybe one, two, three? So here's how we do this. Now, I already wrote this code for you. So you can just run this, but I'll, I'll run, run through it just to show you how it works. You can use the read table command to uh, read the CSV file that has all this information in it. And then what I do is I basically just plot the values into a three-dimensional plot using this plot three function. And then I color it depending upon which class it's in. So if it's Sentosa, I made it red. If it's uh, Versicolor, I made it green. And if it's Virginica, I made it uh, blue. And in this particular case, I'm doing pedal length, width, and sepal length because I'm restricted in three dimensions. But we still have that fourth dimension here. And it looks like um, the Sentosa is generally correlated by having a lower sepal length and a medium uh, pedal width and a, and a lower uh, pedal length. And the Virginica generally has a larger sepal length larger uh, pedal width, and then maybe medium pedal width. But we could we can now sort of see there is some delineation data, but it's hard to see in three dimensions. And it's even more difficult to see in four dimensions. So now that we have this, we have to do a PC analysis on it. Thankfully for us, MATLAB has a built-in PC analysis tool, and it's a function. So all you have to do is just pass it the data itself. And once you pass it the data, it gives back your principal components the score, which you can consider to be the amount of variance each explains. And it also gives out um, various other parameters that may or may not be interested to us. For our purposes, what we really care about is what the score is and how much does it explain the variance. So if I look at the score value here and I plot just what score one and score two are, that will correspond to principal component one and principal component two. And if I plot them, you can see here, oh, principal component one um, seems to delineate between Sentosa and the other two um, uh, classes pretty well. And principal component two, not so much, but it does separate the vertical distance a little. So now you can see you can easily cut a line through this data right here and at least separate Sentosa and perhaps cut a line right through here and separate various color. And if you take a look at the um, screen plot to look at the variance explained, principal component one pretty much explains close to 100, maybe 90% of the variance in your data. Principal component two, and eh, not so much, which is why we don't really see much delineation in principal component two. And when you get to three and four, almost nothing. So you could very easily just uh, explain your data set and talk about it using just principal component one and two. And so now that we have principal component one and two, what about if you want to go back to the um, actual data we had? So that would be that's called uh, reconstructing your data set. So in this case, I made a little vector called keep principal components one two. So I'm going to tell my lab keep the first two principal components, and I'm going to add back the mean using this line right here, 
and I'm going to reconstruct the data to using the principal proponent scores and multiplying it by the principal proponents and then adding back the mean. So on the left here, this is what we would have seen if we just directly plotted the pedal width, pedal width and pedal length from the original data set. And you can see here, you can somewhat make out delineations and cutting of the data. But once we did the reconstruction of the data where we left off the, the third and fourth principal components and we just reconstructed using the first two principal components, this is the reconstruction of the data. And now you can see here in the reconstruction, it still follows the general shape of the original data, but now you can better delineate um, the different classes between them. And now it looks like you can cut a line right through here based off pedal length and pedal width and cut a line right through here and separate the three classes as you need. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into MATLAB and show you, show you what it is. So here's your Fisher Iris CSV file and This is a built-in data set that MATLAB has, so it loads automatically. And if you were to open this Fisher table up, it just has the different uh, parameters and the species, and 150 of them. Now, this is where I'm parsing the data. So now I've separated all of them. Here's where I did my plotting. Give it a second, and I can see a nice little plot show up here. And you can investigate your data set in three dimensions. And here's where you can do the PC analysis. Like I said, it's a single uh, command. It does it very quickly. And now you take a look at the bar chart for your variance, like I had on the PowerPoint. And then you can look at principal component one and two and see how it uh, explains your data set. And then here's where I go about reconstructing your data set with comments explaining how to do it. So now you're back in your original dimensions. But now you're without the 34 principal components. So that's it for PCA. Any questions? So you can use PCA for any, any sort of application? You can use it for any data that has multiple types of measurements that you want to reduce. So in this case, we had sepal length with height and so on and so forth. But in something else, you might have like temperature, uh, accelerometer data, uh, time of day, just data, data, data describing something. And you just want to know out of all of these parameters I recorded, what actually matters in terms of describing my output? Okay, makes sense. And when you uh, get your PCA components, and you plot them on a 2D graph. So you can start delineating uh, regions of interest. I believe yeah. they circulate, right? Yeah, so you can start clustering up your data. Right. And your principal components are linear combinations of your variables. So um, you can see, oh, the f my first principal component explains the most. And my first principal component shows that, oh, uh, if I do a reconstruction of the data, um, maybe it's the accelerometer data is not that important as the temperature data was or something like that. Yeah, and that's how you delineate stuff. And usually principal component analysis is used in conjunction with other techniques. So if there aren't any more questions, I'll move on to the next part, which is computer vision. So the computer vision is to program a computer to understand a scene or features of an image. And the objective is usually to detect or segment or figure out certain objects in an image. And because computer vision is such a large field, it can very quickly get complicated. So in terms of like an example I wanna show you guys, I'll just show you a very simple example of counting objects in an image. So, First, I want to delineate the difference between uh, computer vision and image processing. So image processing is if you have an image that you input and you have an image that comes out. So this would be a case of you put in an image and you get out the smooth version. You put in an image and you sharpen it. You put in an image and you do contrast adjustment. You put in an image and you stretch it or smush it or something. 
And here's an example where you had this background tissue and this medical device here, and they did a bit processing on it to enhance what is the foreign object in the tissue and what is the background tissue. Computer vision, on the other hand, is when you take in an image and the output is not an image, but some feature of the image. And in this case, you're trying to understand parts of an image. And usually before you feed in the computer vision of uh, the image, it goes through an image processing uh, algorithm. So the image out here becomes the image in here. So what you can do now is rather than enhance or smooth the image or anything, it does something like, for example, count how many squares are in this image. Where are the centers of these things in the image? So these are features. So examples of computer vision would be OCR, so reading characters um, from uh, image. So here's an example, input image, output text, it's a feature. Um, you can do machine inspection. So they usually use these in large, uh, uh, plant processing uh, places where they, it looks for defects and objects. Um, you can do 3D modeling of buildings. So if you have two different cameras and they're looking at in the same image from multiple different views or the same object, you can use this information to reconstruct data of the image of the uh, device or of the object. You can also use it to track a uh, person's movements o um, over time. So this would be um, useful for doing medical imaging. You can also use it to track ob objects moving in a scene. So like cars, for example, what's a highway and such. You can also use it to identify uh, regions of interest in images. So in this case, trying to figure out uh, what parts of a particular MRI scan could be cancerous or not. Um, fingerprint recognition, biometrics, and so on and so forth. So for our simple case example, we're going to do object counting, specifically how many uh, staples are there in this image. So here's an example of an image with some staples here. You can see here it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 staples in this image. So we're going to see if we can write a quick little computer vision algorithm that can count how many of these are in the image. Now, this might not seem that interesting to you, but if this was, for example, cells on a dish or maybe nanoparticles um, somewhere, then you wouldn't want to count those by hand. You can write an algorithm that does it for you. So first you do the IM read and you can read the image. IM show actually shows you this image. And like I said before, the, before you do uh, uh, computer vision, you usually want to do image processing beforehand. So for us, um, we can use some image processing techniques like IM top which um, enhances what the background and foreground is. Then you can use I am open to better delineate uh, parts of an image. In this case, I'm trying to specify, I'm trying to look for something square that is about 15 pixels in the Y and three pixels in the X. And then I'm gonna do a thresholding. So I'm gonna turn everything from grayscale values to black and white values. And if you, uh, play around with these image processing steps correctly, you'll get this output um, black and white image here where you can better delineate what is a staple and what's not a staple. And so now that you have this, you have a good starting point for an in -process for a computer vision algorithm. And for this computer vision algorithm, what we're gonna do is called blob analysis. And in this case, we create, we do uh, what's called H blob on our image. And this will return back to centroids of this. So it looks at each of these little uh, particular white lines and returns what the centroid location is of each of them based upon how many blobs it thinks is in the image. And the way it knows what's a blob and what's not is the separation between the black and white. So now that we have this, we can count how many centroids it found and then report back on the screen. And in this case, it found 11 staples, which is correct. Now, showing you that. You can see the staple image here. For example, I'm gonna call up HBLOB, which is a uh, blob analysis, part of the vision, uh, computer vision toolbox in MATLAB. So now it's loaded here. Now I'm gonna do my blob analysis. I'm gonna do my image processing first. And I've explained what each part of the code does here. So you can look, uh, read it at your leisure. 
And now I'm going to do the actual blob analysis where I'm going to call our each blob that we made up here. And I'm just going to pass it the actual black and white image. And I'm going to apply it to the screen itself. And it counted 11 staples. And here's the final reconstructed image. So before I go to machine learning, any questions on computer vision? Yeah, so I think it would be harder to delineate certain objects in, in a picture that's that's not so easy to filter, right? So it's oh, definitely. Okay. And that's actually where machine learning can actually be do a little better at it. Because machine learning sort of just takes whatever information you give it and tries to learn what is or isn't important in, in your data set, no matter how weird it is. But computer vision is better after you pre-process it, pre-process the data a little bit. Thank you. All right. So moving on. Uh, machine learning, gigantic field. So this is data now, uh, uh, analytics technique where you try to teach computers something that is all comes naturally to humans and animals, and that's to learn from experience. And by learning, we mean you want to infer some information around data without relying on any predetermined equation that explains your data set. So there's no uh, specific equation that the, that the algorithm knows that can express your data. All it knows is the data itself. And for us, what we would do is we would just look at the data and try to see if we can figure out patterns or something. And from there, we would learn from our experience and say, oh, um, parts of your data look like this, parts of your data look like that. These are probably related, these are probably not related. So that's really easy for us to do, not so much for a computer. So because there are just way too many different machine learning applications and algorithms, I'm just gonna focus on a subset for the example, and that's gonna be classification of species. And specifically, it's gonna be the same iris data set before. We're, we're gonna to try to see if we can uh, create a machine learning algorithm that can figure out what the data, what the classes are for the different flowers based upon the parameters that we give it. So overview of machine learning. So you have machine learning as a whole, and you have generally three types of machine learning. You have supervised machine learning, unsupervised, and reinforcement. Inside supervised, you have classification, which is what I'm going to show you. You have regression. And in unsupervised, you have, you have association, clustering. And then reinforcement is a separate thing. Now, going into each one, supervised learning is where you present your AI system with already labeled data sets. And you train the machine to try to figure out how to best categorize something based upon the training data set. So, in this case, you have your labeled ob observations, and you separate your labeled observations into a training data set, into a test. And your machine learning algorithm trains on the training data set and tries to figure out if there's a pattern, what's going right, what's going wrong, because it knows what the labels are for this training data set. And based off that, it makes a prediction model. And now this prediction model, you throw it against the test data set that it has never seen before and see how well it does. So you take a look at the stats. If this is not clear enough, you repeat the algorithm again and have it train some more. And then you make it look at the test again. If it's still not good, you iterate and until it's um, better able to label your data sets um, on your test set just as well as on training data. The other way is classification. So this is another kind. Uh, this is the first kind of supervised learning. So the classification is where you have a target variable that's categorical, and you want your algorithm to try to separate them. So this could be as simple as red versus blue. This could be disease versus not disease. This could be spam email and not spam email. And here's an example where you have your two data sets, and you're trying to teach your um, machine learning algorithm to separate the two um, based off just whatever it thinks is the best way to separate them. And there are algorithms that you can use to do this for you. So examples that are used a lot in literature are k nearest neighbors and support vector machines. So if you ever hear about these two being thrown around in literature, they're a type of supervised learning for classification systems. 
The next one is when you're trying to um, uh, try to figure out if you can measure a target variable that's continuous. So your output is some sort of numeric value. So in this case, our output for classification was just one or the other, or just a couple of choices. In this case, it's continuous. So for example, here on our right, we can see um, test scores on the X and IQ on the Y, let's say. And we wanna see, can we make a regression line that sort of cuts between them and tries to predict what a person's IQ is if you know what their test score is. And popular algorithms that do this are called linear regression or ensemble methods. Unsupervised learning is where you give the AI system unlabeled, uncategorized data. So no longer does the AI system know this is red, this is blue, um, this is continuous or not, it's just data, just general. And the job of the system is to see if it can act on the data without any prior training. And there's two ways that can do this. You can do clustering or association. Clustering, as the name will imply, is where it just sort of group, tries to see if it can delineate and group the data sets into small little clusters based on how it sees them being related in terms of their variables. Association is a bit more abstract and it's trying to see if it can find relationships between your data to other parts of your data. So for example, let's say you go to the um, your supermarket and you're interested in buying a tropical fruit. Oh, if you're interested in buying a tropical fruit, maybe you're also interested in canned vegetables, grapes, some cheeses. Um, if you're interested in buying vegetables, maybe you're also interested in meats, onions, uh, specialty cheese. It sort of looks for association from your data. So for clustering, um, like names and flies, it tries to, uh, given your data set, it tries to divide things into groups. And the graph on the right can show you how one such uh, um, unsupervised learning algorithm separate your two data, uh, your data set into three little groups. Some popular um, algorithms that do this are Gaussian mixtures and K means clustering. Association would be more when you wanna find the relationship between variables in a very large data space. For example, uh, people who buy uh, bread, let's say, they also tend to purchase butter. And if they do that, then there's an association between them that you might not notice beforehand. So you can use a learning classifier system here or an SVD. An SVD is actually very closely related to a PCA. And the last sort of oddball is reinforcement. So in reinforcement, you use a set of decisions um, to find something that maximizes a reward. So this is often used a lot in gaming as the best example. So in this case, the reward is um, to increase the score. And um, the inputs would be to move this paddle. So the algorithm only knows that it has to move this paddle in such a way to maximize the score. And all it knows is probably the image of what it sees right here, where the little ball is and where it is. And, ha and all you tell it is, all you can do is move this paddle left and right, and your job is to increase the score. And so you train it. So initially, it stays off to one end, it doesn't know what to do. And eventually, it, after 15 minutes of training, it does a little better, it starts moving it, trying to say, oh, it, every time I hit this, um, and this little ball hits this uh, color block blocks over here, the score goes up, that's a reward, that's what I like. And then eventually it gets so good at it that it's sort of blindingly fast. And that's reinforcement learning. So before I go into our data set, any questions? And so the hardest one would be reinforcement learning? Pretty much because this has aspects of machine, um, what's called a computer vision and image processing in it inherently. So you, um, the image that gets fed to the computer might have to be pre-processed first. And usually you have to like uh, allow the comp uh, program to control computer or controller inputs as well. So it can get really complicated really quickly. There are a lot of YouTube uh, tutorials that explain how to make up like, for example, a GTA bot or something. Yeah. Nice, thank you. I think I once saw a video of somebody who made one for Flappy Bird and it was the scariest thing I've ever seen how better that thing was than any amount of trading a person could do. Yeah, I guess for like the highest levels. I didn't know the game actually ended. 
Yeah, and eventually it got to the, such a high level that it, I think, overrode the counter for the score, and then the game actually has to quit because the counter can't go higher than that. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. So that's how that was done. So we're going to look at the Iris data set again. So just to reiterate, we have four different variables, 150 samples. They each fall into one of three classes or species. And we're going to see if we can train a machine learning algorithm to figure out based off of the data set here, can you figure out what species everything belongs to. So what we're, just to reiterate at a higher level, we're going to use these four parameters, sample length, sample width, pedal length, and pedal width, feed it into a machine learning algorithm of some kind, and see if it can predict what the species or classes from the input. No very no uh, pre notion of uh, what's it called uh, um, equations. All it knows is that for a given sample length, width, uh, and pedal length and width, it has a specific uh, categorization for a label, and it has to be able to predict this. So first off, just as before, we're going to do read table and read the data set. I'm going to make the species, so the classes here, so these three classes right here, I'm going to make them a categorical variable. It's just required for the algorithm to work properly. And here's where you can make your life much, much easier. So in MATLAB, if you're unsure how to code something, chances are you can find a little personalized app that actually does it for you. So in this case, there's a classification learner app that does exactly what we need. We have a bunch of data set here, and we want to classify it. So we need a classification learner app, and you can find it by going to the apps tab over here on the top and clicking classification learner. So I'm gonna quickly show you where that is. And actually, let me go here and machine learning first. Load this data set in. You can also just directly type in um, classification learner, or you can go here to apps. And you have classification learner here. I'll just run it right here. And you have to give it maybe 10 or so seconds to open up. And so now that this is loaded, you can make a new session right here. And you can start from. workspace our predictors are four variables so now that we have this you can do you can set up how you want to do your validation you can do cross validation um, and you can do your whole validation so it tries to make your training and your testing data set here so in my case I'm gonna do a cross fold val validation bifold standard so cross validation is you have your test data, you have your full data set here. And the first iteration where it does the um, algorithm training, it splits your data up into a small little segment and says, this is your test data. And then the remainder is your training data. And then next time around when it does the second iteration, it has, it looks at a new subset for your test data and everything else is your training. And then as it goes through this, it does it over and over again. And this K is how many times it does this. So in our case, I want to do five-fold validation. So it's going to cut my data up into five different folds. Holdout validation is if you have your full data set here and you split it and partition it so that you have a holdout and you have the actual data set itself. So in this case, it's an 80-20 split. Sometimes you want to do a 75-25 split and sometimes you want to do a 60-40 split. In general, the more you train, the higher your training percentage is, the better your algorithm is on that data set, but then the less data set you have against the train to test with. So you can imagine that your algorithm will train really well on this data set, but because it's trained so well here, when it uh, uh, runs into a strange case on your test, it doesn't do too well. Or the reverse could happen, you don't have enough training 
um, data set. So when it sees the test data set, it doesn't know what's what. So the, you sort of have to play around with what's the best threshold to pick. So for our case, I'm just going to use the standard fivefold, start up our data set. <coughs> and you can see here by default, it quickly shows us um, your data set. In this case, it's doing sample length versus sample width. You can change how the X and Y looks like here. And you can see the classes, which we have as categorical variables, are, li are delineated by our different colors here. So you can turn them on and off as you want. And you can plot different things as you want them to and see how they relate to each other. But what we're interested in is can we figure out a classification algorithm that can delineate which one to use? And MATLAB actually makes this really, really easy. You can actually have a history of different algorithms you've tried out. So in this case, for example, we have a tree algorithm. And if I do a training on this, and by default, MATLAB wants to use up all the cores on your computer to do this. So it opens a parallel pool. Give it a second. So it's connected to a parallel pool, four workers. It's queued, it's doing the training. And it reached an accuracy of 96.7%. So just the default by itself was able to categorize the species based upon sepal length, width, um, and petal length and width into its respective uh, class with 96.7% accuracy. So, so now that you've trained an algorithm, let's say, um, you want to see how well it did. So you can look at what's called a confusion matrix. And the confusion matrix shows you how many, how, how the algorithm predicted versus what the true class was. And ideally, you should just see a perfect diagonal with, no, with zeros everywhere else. So in this case, for example, uh, the prediction was Tatosa, and it predicted all 50 cases correctly with no incorrect. Uh, the predicted was versus the color. And the true class was versus color, but in this case, it misclassified two of them as Virginica. And in this case, for example, um, the predicted class was Virginica, but the true class for, for these four um, was versus the color instead. So red cells, prediction and truth did not match. Blue cells, they do match. So for our case, we can take a look at the confusion matrix. And you can see here, Every Stentosa was categorized properly, but the versa color, um, there are two miscla misclassifications and the Virginica had three misclassifications. You can also take a look at what's called the ROC curve. And ideally the ROC curve has a near 90 grand bend to it. And it basically shows you how much uh, your false positive rate was to your true positive rate. So let's actually go back here and try training some more algorithms. So we tried the tree, but you actually have an entire list of algorithms you can train. So if you don't know which one to pick, you can actually just do um, some quick guess started one. So these are the algorithms that are fast to train. So this is gonna train multiple ones all immediately. So if I right click this and train, it's gonna train all of these popular ones and see which one works. So 96.7, 96.7, 95.3, 96 it still looks like our tree was the best one so far. And if you want to just do everything, you can also click all, and it will try to train all of them. Oh, looks like we hit a 98%. 33% for the ensemble method. So it looks like our best was the linear discriminant or the quadratic discriminant. So, if we take a look at, let's say, the quadratic discriminant, and we take a look at its confusion matrix, it only had one misclassification for versa color and two misclassifications for Virginica. And if you notice here, you actually have the option of turning on or off PCA components. So, for example, let's say. Um, on its PCA, and let's say keep 90, 
um, specify explain variables. So keep as many principal components such that you explain, let's say, 90% of your data. If I do this, you'll now see the linear discriminant has this PCA component attached. It didn't do so well. So figure out which one works best. Now let's say you found which one you want to use. You can click here over on export model and export it to your data to your actual workspace as an actual variable that you want to use. And if you want to actually, you can use the name of the model itself, so train model one, and do use its predict function. And what the predict function uh, will take as an input are the four param or are the parameters that it expects for your variables. And if you forget, you can look at train model dot required, required variables. And for us, because we train the model using the four different parameters, pedal length, pedal width, sepal length, and sepal width, when you do predict function, you're gonna have to give it a vector that has those four values in that order for it to predict the class for it. If you give any extra variables, it's just gonna ignore it. So let me quickly show this to you. So let's say you wanna use the linear discriminant, make sure you click on it, export model, and it's gonna call a train model. Click okay there. Go back here. And so now you, we see here, we have a train model in our workspace. And if you look here on the required variables, we have our four variables that are required. We have our predict function here. And so let's make a quick uh, test point here, which are your four points that are in the same order as your required variables. So I'm gonna quickly run this. So we have our test point. You have to actually turn it into a table as weird as it sounds. So I'm gonna quickly run these part of the codes right here to make this into a table. And if we take a look at our test point, we have our sepal length being five, sepal width, pedal length and pedal width. And you just drop this right into the predict function. And it predicts this is Stetosa. Simple as that. And remember this predicts it with 98% accuracy. And that is it for a quick, uh, small little dive into computer vision. Any questions? Or not computer vision, machine learning. Any questions? So for the data sets available for the algorithms, it's just a bunch of uh, mathematical expressions that we that are available. And each one is a different sort of iteration on how they, on the way they do machine learning. Yeah, so like I explained before here, some are better for others. So for example, uh, um, if you have data that needs clustering, k-means is better. If you have data that can be delineated better, sometimes regression, so a linear regression better, sometimes sample is better. You saw some of these names on the options we could have picked. And sometimes k-nearest neighbors is better, but they're all inside of this that you can pick and play around with. Some are better than others. So you have the nearest neighbors, your ensemble, support vector machines. And if you wanted to, you could just test all of them and see which one works, which is generally what you want to do. But if you have a large enough data set, this might be um, bad because it could take a really long time. So maybe you can have a little hindsight and say, oh, my data set might work best if I try to do a linear quadratic discriminant. And, or maybe my, I know my data set might work better with support vector machines. So I'll just focus on these instead. So you sort of have to give like an educated guess um, to how you want to go about tackling your data. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? Anali? No? All right. I think that does it. Sounds good. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, the next one I believe is imaging processing, right? I believe so. So the first part of the image processing at least. Sounds great, because I, re I remember part of it now. Edge detection, we just went over it in lab one, so mm -hmm. can't wait to look forward to that. Ah, but edge detection has a lot of intricacies in it that I don't think the lab covered. Uh, we'll cover it. Sounds great, all right. Well, 
take care, everyone. Thank you, Asad, once again for coming. Uh, hope everyone stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. All right, take care.